Um, I'm from the UK, and since uh, about 2010, I've been using Cassandra. Um, and I actually started the, the London Meetup group um, back then when we were using version 0.6 in production. Um, things have come a long way since then. Uh, I, I work for a company called Halo, um, and they have uh, an app that is similar to uh, a US-based competitor that you're probably more familiar with um, over on the West Coast. Uh, and it's basically an app that you can press a button and we'll dispatch a car to come pick you up, take you where you want to be, um, and then you can jump out the other end and we'll, we'll deal with the payment and send you a receipt. And this is, this is a little bit like the, uh, the Apple talk now. So I'm actually launching a brand new feature on stage right now. Um, slightly fortuitous in that it, it just happened to launch this morning. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, this is, this is kind of almost uh, the Flint Center now. So we just launched a brand new feature where you can, you can jump into a cab even if you haven't actually hailed it via our app and it will automatically discover that you're in the cab via the iBeacon system, and then you can just pay as normal and it'll send you a receipt and you can track your trip history. So, so we're breaking new ground. And Halo, Halo are a company who have not made it to the West Coast yet, but we are, we are on three continents. So we have operations in London where we started. Uh, we have operations on the East Coast, so we're in a bunch of cities, New York, Toronto, um, Chicago, a few other, few other places. And then over in Asia, we, we've just announced that we're launching Singapore um, with a partnership with SMRT. Um, and we're also in uh, Osaka and uh, Tokyo. And it's kind of that, that geographical uh, distribution of, of, our, of our business was one of the reasons uh, kind of that, that drove us into using Cassandra. Um, the, other, the other things that we looked at when, when adopting Cassandra were resilience, so, so we wanted to be able to have uh, great availability. Um, and also to cover future growth. But we, Halo, Halo isn't a company that are kind of solving big data problems particularly. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies around who will talk about, you know, millions and millions of uh, data points and terabytes or whatever. Um, we don't really have that problem, but Cassandra has got such a good set of features that it actually covers quite a lot of use cases. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is really um, kind of our Cassandra adoption timeline, how we, how we started Halo, how we went from uh, a MySQL backend when we launched and kind of why we did that, and then and through to today, where we're running, we're running systems that are solely backed by Cassandra now. Um, so we've migrated everything onto Cassandra, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we use Cassandra, the different use cases we have for it, and why we think it's good. And I'm also going to talk about, um, I'm going to try and sort of talk about the the general uh, problem of if you're starting a startup, what what storage backend should you choose? So. This tweet floated past uh, a few weeks ago. This is from Al Toby, who's one of the, one of the guys who works at Datastax. And he said, um, he said, dream big or go home. Your startup will end up with an AP data store, so why not start out with three nodes of Cassandra or React? Uh, and this got me thinking, because I guess the alternative viewpoint is that you should start simple with something like Postgres, something that you know, is, is sort of more immediately familiar and, and, and more basic. Uh, not, not basic in terms of functionality, but just basic in terms of it's not distributed, it just runs on one node. Um, and then scale out as and when you need to. Um, so I was thinking about you know the decision for Halo. So we, we started with MySQL, um, and when the company when the company was founded in 2010, uh, Cassandra was at version 0.6. Uh, as I've alluded to already, I, I actually used Cassandra at 0.6, um, and it was it was reasonably painful. It was it kind of drove us to start a meetup group about it because that's that's kind of how difficult it was. Um, if you fast forward to today, I think potentially you would do things differently. But, but back then it was definitely the right decision to, to go with MySQL in, in Halo. And so, so, this, um, so we ended up with a kind of story of adoption, of, uh, of migration from, from MySQL through to Cassandra. Uh, and while we were migrating the database, uh, there were other migrations happening within the company as well. So the architecture kind of changed as well at the same time that we changed our data store. So this is what we started off with at Halo. This was kind of our launch infrastructure uh, on AWS. We ran in one region, in the EU region, and we had we have two apps. So Halo works by having two apps. There's one app that the drivers have in their in their cabs as they drive around, and there's another app that the passengers have to, to hail taxis. Um, um, we had two applications written in PHP that kind of sat behind those apps, and then below it was uh, a sort of bigger Java application that kind of did some of the heavy lifting. And all of these things talked to MySQL, and there was a kind of sprinkling of Redis. And this is what we launched with. 
Um, it had kind of it had some minimal resiliency in that we had a MySQL multi-master, um, so we could lose one one of the databases. Halo was a company that that kind of set off um, with a with a growth story. We wanted to we knew we wanted to be on more than in one city straight away. Um, and we, we soon were launching in, uh, Dublin was the next city we launched in, and then after that we knew we were going to go to the US. We didn't really have time to, um, to kind of make grand changes before we went into Dublin. But what we did want to achieve was we wanted you to be able to take your um, phone, fly to New York, get out, get a cab, basically. And we wanted, if you were in the, new, if you were in the US, we wanted your phone to connect to local data centers in the US. And if you are in London, we wanted you to be able to connect to local data centers in, in the EU to give you kind of low latency and to give a, a better experience. Um, so what we did was we introduced, um, we got rid of MySQL basically from the kind of customer app side. So the customer app, we, we hollowed out all the functionality that that component of the application stack had. And we replaced it with these kind of broad services. So here we've got, um, yeah, for instance, the customer service stored customer records. So you know, when you register or update something about your account, that would be stored in there. And this is where we introduced Cassandra first of all. So we introduced Cassandra as the back-end storage mechanism for those components. And this was kind of a, a nice pattern because we could run, you know, on that side of the picture, we could run more than one of everything. We could run them on in multiple regions, and if anything died, it would carry on working. On the other side of the picture, on the left, we've, we're sort of, uh, we, there are, you, there's a green stripe that you, you can't really see brilliantly on the, um, on the slides, but we basically duplicated what we had in London. So we just kind of copied and pasted it over to New York and, and ran you know, New York out of that. So, so we continued to run on MySQL on that side. And, and this has kind of become known internally as like H1.5. So this is kind of a uh, one and a half generation architecture. No, we didn't. So the decision to make MySQL predated me joining the company. Um, I came in about one and a half months before launch. But by that time, most of the basics were in place. Um, so no, we, we did yet to migrate all of the kind of that relational um, world view into a kind of non-relational world view. So what we ended up with was something that looks like this. This is kind of what our architecture looks like today. And we've taken a lot of inspiration from Netflix. Um, and they can really, uh, they can be thanked for, for, for kind of showing us that this could work really, or giving us the confidence to do it. So we've replaced um, the kind of broad services that, that we'd written, which were HTTP services. And um, instead, we've got this uh, kind of microservice architecture. So we write services in Go or Java, and they all talk to each other via RabbitMQ. Um, and in fact, in production, we've got about 130 of these things. Every single one of them that needs to store stuff will use Cassandra. Cassandra is kind of the one thing that joins the regions together. That's how data gets between regions. So you can see at the bo very bottom of the picture, there's kind of an arrow going left and right. So we can run this in architecture. Uh, the, we run it on uh, multiple AWS regions. Um, the whole thing's kind of fully automated, so we can spin them up and down on demand. Um, the services run in auto-scaling groups. And one of the interesting things that, that, that kind of happened as we, as we started to build this system was that we, kind of, we, we took the things from Cassandra that we liked and we applied them in other places. So I think it's fair to say that for the team that built Halo, Cassandra was kind of the first distributed system that they really had exposure to. Um, before then, we had a very much um, kind of monolithic sort of view of the world. But, but it, was th it was Cassandra that kind of led us in the direction of building distributed systems. So we've ended up with a system that's very distributed and has some of the features that we liked in Cassandra, like having no master node, um, not, you know, not being able to kill anything, and it will carry on working. And to kind of give you... Um, an idea of what it looks like. So this is our, um, this is a very washed out version of, uh, of, our, um, of our kind of network diagram. This shows how all of our 130 services are kind of talking to each other. So we trace the traffic as it goes through the, through the SOA. Um, and the, the, this is a chord diagram that kind of shows how the services talk to each other. And I think it just gives you a kind of a quick glimpse as to the, the kind of scale of what we've ended up with. And one of the things we did at the same time is we kind of applied the, the same worldview to kind of how we do testing. So, you know, again, you know, lots of automation, lots of being able to kill things and then carry on working. And we use this, we have a kind of testing setup that is kind of running soak test. So it's, 
it's not um, it's pushing through a, con a continuous level of medium load through a pretend system. So we have a bunch of pretend drivers who drive around uh, and they do pretend jobs with pretend customers. Um, and this is kind of a map showing sort of 20,000 of them just rammed into a very small square in a city. Um, and this is kind of how we can assert that the, the 130 service system is still up and running. So behind all of this is, is Cassandra. Cassandra is the, the, the data back end for, um, for, the, for the whole system now. And we've, we've, we've ended up, uh, and there's some been most of some migration here as well. And what we're running today is we're running two clusters, which we've kind of named premium and economy. Um, the premium the cluster is running on SSDs. Uh, the whole thing's on Amazon, so we're, we're completely kind of cloud native. We run everything on Amazon. Um, and the economy cluster is on, on the ephemerals. Um, we did at one point use uh, EBS at Halo um, until Patrick told us off to the point where we stopped using it. Um, but the reason for the split was that we found that as we migrated more and more stuff onto Cassandra, we um, uh, and, and in fact one of the one of the kind of designs of having this this SOA, this microservice SOA, um, was the was the kind of idea of freedom and responsibility. We we want people to be able to build a new service and ship it to production quite quickly. And ideally, that won't have much impact on what's there already. And what we were finding was that some of the, um, some of the patterns of use were kind of conflicting with each other. So we would have write heavy workloads that would cause lots of compaction in Cassandra. And that would impact the read performance. So it would make it kind of less, um, less, less uh, flat line, more, more, you know, more, more variable. So what we did was we split it out. And the premium cluster is a cluster that we put read heavy workloads on. And the economy cluster is where we put write heavy workloads. And the way it also generally breaks down at Halo is that the, the right heavy workloads are, are normally kind of secondary things. So uh, one example is that when you're doing a job, we, we store um, the driver's location every five seconds. So he's pinging us his location, and we put that into Cassandra in a row so that we can do things like draw a map for customer services to show you where you've been. Um, but if that thing doesn't work, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to stop you getting in the, you know, get in the cab, getting, in, getting to your destination, paying for your ride, getting out and going on your way. So the economy cluster has kind of ended up being the cluster that is, is kind of less important as well in, in some respects. We're using the, um, because we're running 2.0, two we're using one of the features that uh, Aaron Morton mentioned in his talk, which was the, um, the ability to, dro to drop kind of uh, your own um, metrics uh, instrumentation systems into Cassandra. So we're using the Graphi uh, instrumentation system. And this is a uh, graphene, which is kind of grabbing all the graphs together for us. And this is what we're using to monitor our clusters. This is, this is kind of a, a live view of them. Um, and we found that that's one of the major advantages we've got from going to 2.0. So as we've, as we've been migrating all of the things over, the we've, we've found that the, they b generally break down into four, four main use cases. Um, we've got entity storage, so that's like, this is kind of the bread and butter. I guess of most apps, it's, it's the kind of boring stuff of, you know, I create me a customer, update my name, uh, change my email, whatever, um, you know, jobs, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Um, then we've got time series data. So, you know, the points are a good example. The driver's sending his location update every five seconds, and we're storing that as a, as a time series list of, of data that we can read back. Uh, and there's a lot of other things that kind of fit into that, that kind of world view of, of, of you know, time order data that you want to be able to query by time. Then the search. Uh, which for Halo is is mainly for management portals, so it's not we don't need that to work to get you a taxi. And then finally, there's analytics, which is you know kind of how many how many times has this happened. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through each of these and, and kind of show how we used to do it on on our first generation architecture and then how we're kind of doing it today. And then in in some aspects, you know, there is probably a better way of doing it. So you know we're still on this journey of of, of improving our Cassandra use, which is you know one of the good reasons for coming to the conference. So I'll, I'll try and sort of highlight where, where we could do things better. So for entities, we're, this is kind of some screenshots from our app. We're talking about the basic stuff like, you know, register. So, you know, register me as a customer or store my driver details so that I, you know, and my licensing data and all this sort of stuff. And this is kind of what it would have looked like in the, in the first version of our, um, of our app when, 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 we first, when we first launched. So the interesting thing about this is that MySQL is really doing a lot of the work for us. So we've got the IDs for each customer are being generated by MySQL via auto increment. The index constraints are automatically being checked by MySQL. 
So it's going to work out if someone's already using an email or if someone's already using a phone number. Um, and it's, it's kind of a familiar, it's a familiar pattern, you know, it's something that the developers are familiar with. When you move to Cassandra, uh, some, of this stuff's, um, some of this stuff gets quite a bit harder. Um, so for IDs, we've, we've switched to a system, you know, we haven't got MySQL auto increments anymore, so we've switched to a, a system that's uh, like Snowflake. So Snowflake is uh, an open source project uh, by Twitter, which will generate you guaranteed, unique, 64-bit integer IDs, um, kind of in a distributed setting. So you set each machine up with a unique number, and it will guarantee that the ID generated will be unique. And it does that by kind of constructing the numbers from these, um, from these bits. And the interesting thing about them is that they're, they're, they're called k-ordered, which means that basically if the number's bigger, it means it was generated after the previous number, even though they've been generated on opposite sides of the, you know, the Atlantic, potentially. So that's quite nice. Um, in terms of index constraints, we're kind of using, I remember Jonathan's talk, Jonathan's summit keynote last year, and one of the features he introduced was the kind of lightweight transactions. And he used um, exactly what we do as like the canonical example of why he'd written this feature. So it's kind of the flawed application level zookeeper locking, followed by you know checking stuff in Cassandra and then and then making updates. Uh, and this is kind of still how we do it. So this is this is not kind of not the way to do it basically. Um, and the reason it's not the way to do it is because there's there's lots of kind of edge cases. You know you're 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 kind of trying to get some strong consistency out of an eventually consistent database. So. The, the big problem is if, if something goes wrong, so I, you know, if, if your query fails, it, it, it what it normally means is it, it, it may actually have worked. It means, that, it means that Cassandra doesn't know whether it's finished. So it might mean that it, you know, if you ask for a local quorum or a quorum read, it means it sent it some replicas, but it didn't get an answer from enough replicas to consider the whole operation a success. But crucially, you don't really know whether it worked or not. You know, it might be sat there in, on some of the boxes and eventually make it out. So the kind of ideal solution is is the lightweight transactions that are introduced into version two, um, which you can which you can do via CQL. Now we've only just we've only just at Halo migrated to version two. We d I think we did it about two weeks ago. Before that, we were running version one one something. Um, so we've only just got the ability to do this. Uh, and as yet, uh, uh, we're still we're still kind of in the thrift world. Um, I still have a little soft spot for thrift, but. Um, but yeah, we, we, we need to, we'd need to migrate to CQL to make use of this. Update is relatively straightforward. I mean, this is how we would have done it in our first, first infrastructure. Uh, and CQL or Thrift really are the same. You know, you can, with Cassandra, the only rule really for updating stuff is that you want to just change the columns that you're changing. So if you've got a customer record with, say, 20 columns, and then someone changes their name, you just want to set that one column. Um, if you read the whole thing and then change the column and then write back the whole thing, you can have race conditions. Um, but if you just change, the, if you just mutate the one column, then you're all right. So next up, time series. So at Halo, we we use um, there's there's surprising how many things that end up being a time series. Um, I see time series everywhere I look now. Um, but these are a couple of examples. So in our app, you can look at your trip history. Uh, this is actually my trip history. Um, and then on the portal, you can see, uh, that's kind of a list of all jobs. This is from our um, automated QA environment. So we, we have a system that pushes uh, jobs through in production every 30 seconds to verify the whole system's working. And it runs on Heard Island, which is in the middle of the Atlantic, uh, middle, of the middle of the Pacific, if you look it up. Um, but, but basically, lists of things over time. So this is how we used to do it. So this is kind of back to your point about, you know, did we set off down the route of, thinking that we were going to migrate to non-relational and therefore start that way? And the answer is no, we didn't. We started by putting the stuff in the database and then whenever we wanted to get it back, we'd just write a query, as you do. Um, so we needed to migrate from this to something else for Cassandra. So obviously with Cassandra, one of the things is you need to put the data in, in the way you want to get it back. So what we've ended up with is uh, a system where we've kind of built a library that, that kind of handles the guts of storing stuff as a time series in Cassandra. Um, this is Go. and, and the way it basically works is that you define a time series and say, hey, I want to store this entity, uh, and I want the rows to be kind of 30 days big, or you know, or seven days big, or one day, however big you want them. And then when you want to get stuff out, you can kind of use something like this. You say, hey, get me a reverse iterator you know, for between this start and end date with this customer ID. Um, and then you can kind of loop through them all and get, get the jobs out, or the customers, or whatever it is. 
So what's going on under the skin is that we're, we're kind of doing the, you know, if you've been to any of the data model sessions, uh, we, we're kind of chunking so that the, the row key, the partition key in Cassandra has a time element to it. So for instance, um, behind the scenes, we're kind of breaking things down into, you know, potentially days. And then when you query, we're kind of looking for different days and then joining them all together to give a sort of seamless experience. Um, and the other feature that we've kind of built into this library is that we've, we support kind of sparse data sets. So if a customer, say, does one job a month uh, and you want to be able to read back three months' worth of jobs, um, but say that you've bucketed it so that each, each row is one day, you don't really want to have to go and look for 90 rows. Um, you kind of just want to be able to look, you just want to know that there's only three rows. So we, we've kind of built that in. The ideal solution is probably, again, CQL. Um, this really comes down to the fact that the main, well, the main difference is that in our library version, we're kind of blobbing the values. So for every single entity that we store, we're kind of storing the whole, the whole thing as a, as a blob, and we put it in under one column. With CQL, you can, you can kind of model it slightly differently. So you can, um, you can set it up so that it will kind of break down your, um, you know, if your entity has four properties, it will create you four columns for every um, entry you put in. But it kind of hides all the details behind the scenes. Um, so CQL kind of brings a lot of advantages there. Um, the, the main advantage probably is is just understandability, so that when people come, you know, developers uh, come to Halo all the time, and uh, nearly every single one of them asks why we're not using CQL. And the main reason is because all the resources, you know, all the documentation is all in CQL now, and it means that they'll also be able to kind of go describe table, you know, tell me about your data structure. Whereas the way we do it is is a bit more opaque. It's just blobs of stuff, so you have to go and look at the code. So I think probably this is the ideal solution. The only, da the only downside really potentially is that, I mean, the example I just put up lacked kind of row partitioning by time. So you might have to put that back in. Um, so I if you look, the partition key here in this example is the weather station ID. So, uh, you know, if you store the three billion events for a weather station, then you end up with them all in the same row. Um, so next, search. So this is an example of what we use search for Halo. This is kind of one of our admin portals again, and in, in this is our still our QA environment. Um, so you, you can kind of find people by, you know, keyword. <coughs> the key thing for Halo is that search isn't that important, really. Um, it's not on the critical path. We, we do asynchronous indexing of things, and then the search is really for customer portals and, and, and stuff like that. So it's not super important. This is kind of how it would have looked in version one. So again, we're just looking at the data in the database. Um, yeah. And what we've moved over to is we've, we've used Elasticsearch now. Um, I don't know whether anyone reads the, the kind of um, the Jepsum series of posts, but um, Elasticsearch was one of the things investigated. So we, we, we kind of follow the, we, we basically treat it as a secondary index. We don't store, it's not the canonical source of any data. Uh, at any time, we could throw the whole thing away and then rebuild it. Um, we have kind of microservices that do the job of uh, listening for events and then indexing documents. And in order to replicate globally, we kind of replicate events. So we have something that federates events over to a different region, and then that thing picks them up and also indexes the documents. So that's kind of how it works. The key thing is that the primary data store is still Cassandra. Um, so so we, we, we feel that uh, the data is kind of safe as opposed to putting in Elasticsearch. Analytics, I, I think this is still the hardest thing to get right. Um, I don't know whether anyone else tried to go to the Apache Spark talk that was in the kind of smallest room that you could ever imagine. Um, maybe that kind of shows that it's something that people have still got a lot of interest in in the, in the community. Um, it was heaving. So this is an example of Halo. A again, this is our QA environment, so the lines are quite kind of flat because we just push through jobs every 30 seconds to make sure things are working. But the kind of thing we want to be able to do is say, hey, get, you know, how many, how many people are, how many drivers are around right now? You know, how many drivers are in, have been on shift in the last hour? You know, we want to be able to do things like count the number of distinct customers who tried to book a job in the last hour. So the two real use cases here are count and count distinct. That's the two big things we wanted to do. Um, and what we've done is, um, th this is kind of how it would have looked. Um, in the olden days, this is this is an, I actually dug this out of our old source code. We this doesn't actually run anymore, but I, I dug this out for good measure. So again, this comes back to the question about relational, where 
yeah, we did start off with a relational database and, and you know, people would just group stuff and you know, count and really go to town with queries. What we've ended up moving to is a system where we've kind of decoupled the analytics pipeline from the rest of the application. So what we've moved to now is we've, on the left hand side, you've got these services. So you can imagine there's 130 services that make up Halo um, and they're all doing little jobs. Each one's doing a different, you know, tiny job. And what happens is as they, as they do their stuff, they, they chuck out events. So they're emitting events. Um, and these events will go onto the, the fire hose, which we use NSQ for, which is um, a Go project. Uh, so the Kafka would be another good choice for that, for that component. And all these events kind of flow down and then we have another, you know, we have other services basically that scrape the events out of there and do stuff with them. So the most basic version of this is that we get every event and put it on S3. That's kind of the most basic version. So that's our kind of archive. That's our, our raw data potentially. But we also do other things. So, so, for, so for kind of BI, we put it all into Redshift, which is an Amazon service, which uh, from what I can understand is just like a massive Postgres thing that they've somehow made work. So we, we load it all into Redshift, and, and actually, that was kind of a big change. Like last um, last summit, I did a similar talk, and I would be I was talking about how we at that time we were trying to store all these events in Cassandra, um, and what what was happening was we were we were storing them all in Cassandra, uh, and uh, they weren't all that useful in Cassandra at that time. You know, we didn't really have any way of using them particularly, so we would write them in, and it would take up an enormous amount of space, cost a load of money, um, and it didn't really achieve anything. So we've moved to this system of putting them on S3, which means we can you know, potentially run EMR jobs if we need to. Uh, and we put them in Redshift, which kind of makes them useful. And then the Hob Activity Service is the thing that, that draws those graphs that I showed you on the previous page. So really, like, lots of different things can do whatever they want with these events. So it's quite a nice pattern. And this is, this is one example. So this is a service that we wrote to, to kind of do real-time analytics, uh, you know, in-memory in -memory, um, kind of roll-ups. So what it does is it's, it's basically a bit like stats D, which is the thing you put in front of Graphite. So it listens to the events off of the fire hose and it rolls them up in memory into a data structure, um, which is like a, a called hyperloglog, -log, which is a probabilistic data structure for counting distinct things. And the interesting property of it is that you can merge two of them together. So if you've got two of these data structures with different things in, you can kind of merge them and then get the total count distinct. So what we do is we read all the events, put them into these data structures, and then blat the whole thing into Cassandra as like a blob of binary. So this is kind of where Thrift works well, because you can just put binary into Cassandra. Um, and then when you read it back, you, you can, you know, you can, you can kind of group together columns. So you know, we flush the disk every 30 seconds, I think. And if you've got, say, two or three different machines that are all doing this one job, because we run in a, an environment that's distributed, then that's great, because it, it doesn't matter. When you read them back, you just join them all together and then return the results. Um, the only possible downside is that it can make lots of columns. So if you if you if you know if you're if you wanted to say show me like you know three months worth of data, this system wouldn't really work. And in fact we only use it for we only use it for seven days. So we, we use Cassandra TTLs to flush the columns out of Cassandra after seven days. Um, and it works quite nicely for that. I think the the ideal solution here really is just the, the, the nicest thing probably we ever did was to split the to split out that events firehose um, and kind of decouple that analytics workflow from the rest of the application because it means that people can use the data in different ways uh, and this is kind of one other example of, of real this is effectively real time analytics as well so someone um, someone in the company went away and built this uh, a guy called Stephen uh, I think this was his first service as well and he he built something that listened to all those events off the firehose. Um, and when it, when it got a point, uh, so a location update from a driver, it would kind of keep it in memory. And then if it got another one for the same driver, it would, it would calculate the velocity based on the time and location difference between the two points. And then it would store that in another data structure. In this is all in memory. So this has actually nothing to do with Cassandra. But um, and then what you can do with it is you can basically say, right, well, how, how fast is traffic moving in central London um, or wherever, you know, wherever you're operating? Um, <coughs> This is kind of a view of this running in one of our test environments. And the interesting thing about this was that he, he, could, he could build this service completely independently because the, because the analytics layer is decoupled. And then he could use this data to enhance our, our ETAs. So when you say, hey, you know, how long is it going to take to get me a cab? We can go, well, actually, it's gonna, you know, traffic's not moving in London. Um, so it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, and that makes our service better. 
Okay, so to finish up, I'm, I'm just going to talk about uh, a few of the uh, kind of operational and organizational challenges we had in this process of going from MySQL to Cassandra. This is kind of a view of, of, of kind of how Cassandra has, uh, has morphed um, in Halo over the years. So we, we started off with um, Cassandra version 1.0.9, and we were using PHP CASA with Thrift, and we were only in one region, EU West. And what we've, what we've been able to do with Cassandra, this is, this is kind of one of the stories, this is one of the things that I think is best about Cassandra. So we were able to expand into the US with no downtime. So we could fire up an entirely new cluster in the US, join the two clusters together, get the data replicating between them um, without any downtime. And then eventually we expanded into, into Asia as well. So we fired up a data center in AP Northeast 1, and the same thing, no downtime. Um, and then eventually, we, I think we shut that one down, so we went back to two. So you can kind of up, up and down scale, and, and Cassandra is able to cope with all that. We, we tried out different clients, so we used, a, we used some Java at Halo, we used the Astynax client, um, we used Go, and we used the Gossy client at the moment. Um, and then eventually, we upgraded to version two, and we split the thing into two clusters, and we, ha we migrated all the data over, and, and again, we managed to do that with no downtime. One of the main things we've done since last year, um, I, I've d I did similar, similar, similar ish talk last year, and at the end of it, I said we were going to try and hire someone who knew about Cassandra, which at the time was very, very difficult to find anyone who had come to our organization with any prior knowledge of Cassandra. But we did manage to hire someone, so that's kind of made life easier for the rest of us. Um, you know, as we've migrated uh, to this big microservice architecture, all backed by Cassandra, to have um, to have a couple of people just to sit there and look after it and you know, know about how compaction works and stuff. Some of the other kind of operational challenges we've had. Um, this, was the, the, this was the Go client that we picked. So when we, when we started using Go, we wanted, to, we wanted an easy upgrade path from what we were already doing with Cassandra in, with Thrift. So we picked the client that was Thrift-based. And then the guy who, who built it kind of announced that he'd, he'd done with it. He didn't want anything to do with it anymore. Um, and it did have some significant bugs in it actually as well, so we had to fix all those. Um, luckily, I put this slide in this morning. So this morning, Matt Stump um, from DataStax released this, a brand new driver for Go, which is kind of a, like wraps the, um, the DataStax C++ driver. So I think I've, d I've been doing talks on Cassandra about four years, and pretty much every talk would bemoan the kind of state of the drivers in the, you know, in the in, you know, they're all rubbish basically. But DataStax are basically fixing that now, so that's really awesome. One of the other challenges is is um is kind of a the process of education and, and getting people into the into the mindset of Cassandra and how it works. Um, and there's really two sides to that I see. One of them is is people are terrified of denormalizing. People really really don't like it. So we had we had um, we have people who will who will create a column family and then add like thousands of secondary indexes because then it's a bit like MySQL, but it doesn't work at all. And you know uh, Jonathan alluded to that when he said, oh yeah, you could use this for low volume. And yeah, they, they do actually really mean that. Um, if you actually want to be able to query stuff, you need to write the data more than once and then so that you can read it back. And this was another problem we had where we had, we were writing in time series data and we'd bucketed the data by day. So every single row represented one day's worth of stuff. And as we had more stuff, so it grew until um, we ended up, we had actually, we actually had Aaron Morton come in and give us some consultancy. Uh, this, was, this was a while ago now. And he, he pointed out that one of our rows was 16.6 .6 gigabytes. Um, and, and it would, the, the problem with this is that th this was kind of when we were trying to store all the raw events in Cassandra. And what we'd find is that every now and again, a driver would turn on a phone that they'd had off for a couple of weeks and they'd send us like 10 events. Um, and they'd send us 10 events from sort of two weeks ago. And what happened is we'd have two, 10 new events would need to be merged into a row that was kind of you know 10 gigabytes wide uh, and then, so that basically the entire cluster spent its entire life compacting everything because it was trying to kind of squash together things that, um, that, that were, you know, continuously changing. So actually continually changing wide rows is, is, a, is quite a challenging, Cassandra. So it's kind of that, that job of trying to educate people and, and um, keep track of what people are doing and, and make sure that people aren't ruining your day. Um, <coughs> another interesting problem we had was we 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 used to um, we were running DSE uh, the not DSE we were running the um, the the monitoring thing that the, the name escapes me uh, Opsense that one yeah and it and it, it actually stores all the data for that it's operating it stores it all in Cassandra so it's kind of like the thing that you're you're monitoring is is also 
basically you know adding to your cluster load and we got to the point where actually we we realized that the main the main traffic in our entire cluster was op center so uh, i think it was like you know 99% of all our traffic was op center um, and i think it was just cuz we 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 have a, like a lot of key spaces cuz cuz of the microservice architecture people basically have to have their own key space that's kind of the way we've gone um, which i don't know whether that's a good idea or not t you know, i'm sort of having an ring but we we probably have more than we should and um, so anyway we we built we Luckily, the 2.0 thing came out, and we could instrument it better, and we put it into Graphite, um, and we built this tool, which is called CTOP. So it's like top. You just run it on one of the nodes, and it tells you what's going on. Um, and this is kind of useful. So, th you know, that's one of the other operational challenges, is kind of understanding how this thing's running and, and having enough knowledge to be able to diagnose problems and fix them. Luckily, with Cassandra, it's getting to the point now where it, it for us, certainly, it hasn't really gone wrong. I think if you... If you're at the absolute bleeding edge, then you probably get your fingers burnt a bit. But we're kind of safely just behind that, um, letting other people fix all the bugs, which is a nice place to be. <coughs> and then probably the biggest challenge of all was was kind of the job of um, the the operational job of, of of getting people's minds into the idea of of using a database that wasn't relational. Um, <coughs> and at the same time, we've kind of moved from this monolithic DB to a distributed DB. We've also moved from the monolithic app to the distributed app, so we've got the microservices architecture. And, and we've also moved from monolithic team to distributed team. So what, like, what I mean by that is that when I joined the company, we, you know, we had a back-end engineering team, and we all pretty much worked together. The way we operate now is we have um, lots of small, independent self-organizing teams that are kind of more cross-functional, so kind of a more of a typical scrum thing. So, you know, the interesting thing that, that I think is that all the things on the right kind of go very well together. So having the independent self-organizing teams with a big monolithic app, I think would be quite challenging. And before we migrated, we did have some challenges there with people stepping on each other's toes and, and trying to coordinate changes. You know, if you've got seven teams trying to change one project, basically, it's quite, you need a lot of communication. So the distributed team works really well with a distributed app. So each team can kind of work on their little tiny subset of services, and, and sometimes people need to change the same service, but it reduces the communication and, and, and some of the friction out of the process. And then the distributed app works really well with the distributed DB as well. So wrapping up, um, last, last minute or two. So this is kind of where we started, and, and I think if we, if we started Halo today, I think that we would go with, C with Cassandra. And the factors in that decision, you know, wh one of the main factors would be that Halo has started with a view to being on in multiple continents from day one. That was always kind of a requirement. Uh, and Cassandra just makes that job so easy. And I think it would have been wrong to choose Cassandra version 0.6 because it, it would have been um, too painful to make work. But with 2.0, it's, it's actually, it just works. And then finally, this is um, something that I think we've come to realize at, at Halo, which is that Cassandra and microservices go together really well. Because the one thing that you, you can't do with Cassandra, well, not the one thing, one of the things you can't do with Cassandra is, is you, can't, um, you can't join. So people come from that view of like, you know, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm writing some feature, I'm going to join all of the things together and then create this endpoint. And with Cassandra, you can't do that. But but in the microservices world, you can't do that anyway because you're building services with a you know a small API, a small um, interface, and so you end up with these kind of thin vertical stacks that go all the way through. And actually, Cassandra is very suited to that job. And I think that the the kind of approach of Cassandra, that, you know, running this distributed system database with these properties of high availability, being able to kill any node, I think that that has also fit really well for Halo with the kind of microservices architecture. And I think it's been something that's really helped our team um, learn and, and, and improve um, at their kind of engineering skills by looking at some of the properties that Cassandra has and trying to replicate them. Okay, and that's, um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much. <coughs>